thank you for joining. Um, we can, we'll just get started because it's already, it took me 15 minutes to get on, so thank you. Um, and I, I, first off, I want to say not only thank you for taking the time out of your day to, you know, be here and talk with me, but also thank you to um, all of the communities and people that have supported me, like the AIA and New School. It's great having a good team behind us. So I'm glad you can hear me. <laughs> if, again, if it messes up, let me know. Um, so today I'm talking about the ARE, but back in April, I made a post and a video all about um, my strategies and um, the resources I use to study for the ARE. So if you're just getting started and that's sort of the information that you're looking for, you can go on my website and um, find that video there. Uh, today, I kind of wanted to talk more about the mindset and um, certain things that tend to hold people back. Sorry, last minute adjustments, so I'm not, I gotta get comfortable. Okay. Um, so this can get a little maybe like woo, but uh, to me, I feel like this is one of the biggest things that prevents people from even um, getting started. Um, and I, I put a toolkit on my website that you can download for free. It says a number, but you just put in the code um, uh, to download it. And what I'm talking today about is more fears of um, even just getting started, which can go into anything like starting a business or doing anything in life, but um, I'm going to specifically talk about it for the ARE. And just so you guys know, this information isn't like new necessarily or information that I've, you know, made up myself. It's just stuff that I have learned over the years and um, kind of put into practice and thought that I would share it with you. So with fears, there are four very con oh and I do want to say too that I'm gonna like talk but if you have questions about it too feel free to ask or at the end we can do questions or whatever you want to do um but there's four t common types of fears and these aren't you know obviously there's like life or death fears that sort of thing but more four common types of fears that prevent us from taking risks or doing things um and I'm just gonna name them off real quick and then we'll kind of go through them so there's fear of self self worth, which is like the imposter syndrome. There's fear of failure, fear of judgment, and um, fear of imperfection. And some may resonate with some people, while others resonate with other people. Um, I know there's certain ones that I like can pinpoint. Be like, yep, that's me. So the whole idea of this is to be able to acknowledge it and see when it comes up and be able to kind of tackle it. So by not addressing your fears, you kind of just um, create a lot of excuses like, oh, I don't have time. Oh, too much studying. I'm done with school. I've done the whole school thing. I'm a, I don't want to study. But it's kind of like our um, defense mechanism to prevent us from actually going for it. And um, so let's just start with the first one, fear of self-worth. Um, the imposter syndrome. So this typically looks like, why me? Um, I'm not worth it. Uh, you know, there's much better architects out there or people who are going to be architects. So, you know, why should I be the one to go do it? Um, you know, I'm not smart enough, that sort of thing. There's also the fear of failure. So this is very real with the ARES. It's just you're scared that you're not going to pass. You're just, you're scared that you're going to fail. Um, and you don't want to take risks in order to not fail. So what this looks like is not even signing up or starting the exams because you're scared you're going to fail. Um, and failure is really real with these exams. Um, it's definitely something that most people experience and um, something that you kind of have to address and know that it's going to be okay if you do fail. And that'll be something that I talk about at, towards the end is just like the strategies to get through this and be okay with the failing. Um, so the next one's fear of judgment. And this um, 
is also very real with the ARES, especially if you're working in a firm and you've told everybody that, oh, I'm going to take the ARES or everybody knows. There's a really big fear of judgment that when you do fail, you're looked at as not a good designer or not capable or you're scared your boss is going to be like, oh, why did I hire this person? They're not even passing these exams. So there's a big fear of judgment. Um, even in um, amongst your peers, I remember taking my first exam and I failed my first exam and I was so embarrassed. Like I didn't want to tell anybody because, you know, in school and especially architecture school, and this will be part of the last fear, but especially architecture school, there's a lot of, it's like healthy competition, but you know, there's, um, you know, you're always judging each other's designs and whatnot. And then you go off and then you fail this exam. You're like, oh my gosh, it's so embarrassing. I don't want anybody to know. So there is this big fear of judgment. And then with that is not even taking the risk to take it because you can make that excuse of, oh, I've been too busy. You know, I don't want to take it. So nobody can judge you for failing it. Um, and then the last one is the fear of imperfection. And I think this one really resonates with a lot of future architects and people in the design world because we have gone through a lot of schooling and education and um, there are a lot of perfectionists, perfectionists in this industry. I mean, that's why we're in this industry because we are good at the details and um, you know perfecting those little things. But first off, there'll never be perfection in architecture. Even a set of plans will always be imperfect there it can never be perfect um but this can look like oh you know i have to get the highest grade um <laughs> sorry joe i just saw your terrible seeing the fail i know and i i actually so joe just said the he hates seeing the fail across the screen and um that is something that i want to address because i guess i'm trying to normalize the idea of failure um, and it's not really just to scare you and it's not to, uh, you know, premeditate a fail. It's, you know, cause it's always good to be positive and think of, you know, manifest of pass. But I guess what I'm trying to do with that is after I failed my first exam, I literally went on Google and I just said like, okay, I just, I said failed ARE, like, what do I do? And there wasn't really anything out there. And I think especially, and this goes into the fear of imperfection with architects, I think that we are scared to address those fails or like I said earlier with the judgment, maybe not even tell people that we took it to, don't, don't even tell people we failed because we don't want to um, show that imperfection. And so I guess my whole point of opening up about this and talking about fear and judgment and failure and that whole thing is just to normalize it just to be like look we're all human um yeah we're all wanting to be you know the next Bjark Ingalls and be the best architects but at the same time there's failure involved you cannot get to the finish line of anything of any success without going through the hurdles of failure and so I think it's a topic that we need to be okay with addressing and um, normalizing. So I know it's like, I, I don't want anyone, I don't want to manifest a fail for anyone. I want you all to know you will pass eventually. You'll get through it. Some people pass all of them on the first try. Some people take 10 years to get through it. Some people take 10 days to get through it. I did hear about someone taking it in six days and passing all six and not even really studying much. So there's situations. So don't go in it you know, freaking out about the fail, go in it with, um, I guess w exactly what I'm saying is go into it with the strategies of what to know when to fail. Um, I forget who it was. Um, shoot, I wish I knew, but I, you just made me think of it. Um, there's a coach who coaches um, professional athletes and like Olympic athletes. And one thing he has his athletes do is um, to not only visualize a win, but to visualize a loss. And so that when they do 
when it does happen, like visualize what well, it might even be Tim Ferriss because that's like what I'm going to be going over, but visualize what's going to happen if you do fail so that you know how to react. So you know what to do when, if, or when that happens. Um, so, you know, vi- sit and visualize you sitting at the computer and seeing pass on the sc- screen and feel all those feelings and in the future, you know, try to go for that. But at the same time, sit and visualize seeing fail and feel how you're going to feel. Or another way too, is to sit and at this, this pretend you're sitting at the screen and imagine seeing a question you have no idea what it's even asking. It doesn't even sound like English to you. So, um, sit there and visualize that happening. Well, what do you do? If you, if you don't, if you only think about the positive things that are going to happen when that scary thing comes up you won't know how to react or maybe you'll fight or flight um so say you're sitting there you visualize something coming on the screen that is totally not anything you've ever seen in your life okay well how do i react okay well first of all i just read the questions i can try to knock off whatever i can that seems totally off the charts Okay, then, you know, especially with multiple choice, you just pick one and know that um, there are a certain amount that you can get wrong and move forward, you know, just just and release that fear and move forward. So visualizing um, things going wrong can be beneficial to in the long run. Okay, so um, so those are the big types of fears. And I think what's important is kind of. um, giving them a ranking like one through 10 to see which ones resonate the most with you so that you can kind of um, be aware of them. So say you're sitting down to start the exam or you're sitting down to schedule it and all of a sudden you start thinking like, why am I even doing this? Like, if I, what if I don't know the answers? Well, then you can kick in and be like, nope, that's just myself, you know, worrying about it. Um, if, you know, this is just my fear of imperfection. And then you can kind of move forward. So that goes into the fear setting strategies and actually how to address those. So this strategy is adapted from Tim Ferriss, who is awesome. He has a really good TED Talk, which I highly recommend. Um, if you, you could even just type in Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss fear setting, and it'll show up on Google. You can also, um, it, on my download, I have some links to his and um, so he, he basically s- created this and then I sort of adapt it to this on my toolkit. But his whole thing is kind of like what I was just saying is that you address your fear, you figure out how, what you're going to do if that happens, and then you figure out what the cost is of not going for it. And you kind of weigh out those costs. And then also what that does is it provides um, strategies for if things do go wrong, how you deal with those. So the fear setting strategy, and if you downloaded the um, toolkit again, it's um, on there so you can kind of follow along. It might sound uh, confusing if I'm just spouting it out, but um, you can look it up later. But so basically first you're defining the worst case scenario. So basically your nightmare. So um, in terms of this, you're, you're visualizing or you're defining failing. So you're, um, you know, so what that looks like, and then you're ranking it. So what that looks like is, okay, I fail. So one through 10, how does that really impact your whole life? Um, And generally you will find that your worst case scenarios are usually, I mean, like life or death, they're usually pretty low. I mean, you fail. Okay. It's like maybe, maybe a five because this is, you know, big deal for us. Um, but that's really the worst case scenario. And the other cases are your computer crashes, uh, which actually happened to me on my very last exam. Uh, my computer crashed and it was like halfway through and you're already like sitting there for hours and stressed out. So I just raised my hand and she's like, oh, it's no problem. We'll just do this reset. And she does this reset and it was just blank. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, if all of that work just went away, I'm gonna freak out. So, um, so 
she's like, well, let me move you to another computer. I'm like, okay. And she moves me and she's like, don't worry. Everything's backed up. You're good to go. So thank God it was all backed up. Nothing was lost, but it was still just like that energy of, you know, having that happen and, and throwing you off and everything. Well, I ended up passing, which is good. Um, but I, I did know I'm like, well, you know, if I would have failed, I probably would have been like, oh, well, the computer crash, it's totally, you know, excuse, excuse, excuse. But anyway, so defining your biggest fears, okay, computer crashes. Well, you know, if that happens, then maybe a three, because they'll probably figure it out. Um, and then, and also you're gonna, you can determine your own fears. Yours may be totally different or the same. I'm just giving some examples. Um, another type of fear that you may think of is you're losing all of your, you know, time and money that you put into this and you just failed and now you have to start from the beginning and pay all that money and all that stuff. So then the second strategy or the second um, step is to prevent. So what can you do specifically to reduce the likelihood of that happening? So for example, failure, what, what can you do to prevent um, the likelihood of a fail? Well, you can talk to people who have passed and figure out what their strategies were, what worked for them, um, and you know, go off that to try to get the best information you can. The other thing that you can do is study really hard, you know, study as much as you can so that you are you go in there with, you know, a good grasp of knowledge. Um, and then know what you need to do, so steps that you need to do if your computer crashes or um which it's easy when you're in there. I mean, if your computer crashes, you just raise your hand, and they figure it out. Um I have heard, you know, horror stories about computer crashes and stuff like that, but I think they're pretty well handled. And also right now, I don't, I know they're doing things a little bit differently. And once they start doing online exams, I can't speak for that, but I'm sure they'll have it all figured out. Um, and then, you know, what preventing with the, the whole time and money aspect, you can apply for scholarships. If you work for a firm, you can see if they offer any sort of payment for the exams, which I think a lot of, um, bigger employers do do that. And then um, you can also save specifically for that. And then you can also just go in knowing that any time that you put towards these exams is just making you a better architect in the long run. And it's just going to set you up for, you know, knowing the information better for the next time. Um, Every fail that I had, I looked at it, of course, was bummer. And I was, you know, took a couple days until I could think of the positive, but I did know, okay, I'm going to know this information even better, which, you know, feeling more confident in this industry is always the best. So you're going to know the information way better. And I kind of think I'm like, okay, well, I didn't totally know the information as well as I should have. So probably should have failed. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Okay. So then the last one is repair. So what steps do you do if you fail? Well, you know, you take a deep breath. You realize that um, you have, you know, a 50% chance or whatever of failing. So, you you know, it's you just take a deep, deep breath and you can take a couple days to, you know, just feel sorry for yourself, which is totally fine to do that sometimes. Uh, And then know that, you know, you can just start studying. You can schedule your exam for 60 days out or, um, you know, just take some time to deal with it. Um, But you can also look at it as accomplishment for even getting in there, for taking the exam, um, will, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of like, what are you going to do if it happens? But then it's good to look at, well, what are the benefits of the opposite happening? So what are the benefits of going in there and taking it is passing? And what does that mean? Um, you know, and, and on a scale of one to 10, how does that make you feel? So if you go in there and you pass, likely that's going to make you feel like probably a 10. You never have to take that exam again, as long as you do it within the rolling clock. Um, you feel an accomplishment you know, it feels good. Um, so there's the benefits of going in there and the, the 
positive happening is really, really good. And um, what that can lead to then, uh, you know, the cost benefits of that now and in the long run, you know, higher positions at work, possibly, you know, more salary, potential of, you know, finishing everything and being a licensed architect, something that a lot of us who have gone through all the schooling and stuff, it's, we've done a lot of work now, so getting to that point. Um, and then the cost of inaction. So what is the cost of if you decide not to do it? So say, you know, the fear is that you're gonna fail, so let's just not take it at all. So what are the costs, you know, financially, emotionally, you know, mentally, everything, what are the costs of, oh man, I'm sorry to hear that about <laughs> losing five for the rolling clock. That's not ideal. Um, and I guess you'll just know the information that much more. <laughs> I don't have any advice for that. Oh man. Um, but so the cost of inaction and, uh, you know, what that looks like for now in one year, three years, five years. So putting these this strategy together kind of allows you to figure out what um, what the worst case scenario is that can happen, but then also what you can do to prevent that and also what you how you can feel if that happens. And I think the most important thing that this does is shows you the value of the worst case scenario versus the value of the best case scenario. And generally the value of the best case scenario way outweighs the worst case scenario. So it's just worth it to try because um, in the end, the worst case scenario is you take it again. Luckily, we can just, you know, take it again and pay money and all that. And I know everybody has their own feelings on this, but in my opinion, the worst case scenario, you fail and you take it again. So I hope this is helpful. I, do, again, don't want to scare you about the fails, but I just want to um, give you strategies for not creating paralyzation by the fear of the fail um, and how to kind of work through that. So um, I think fear creates inaction. And so if you work through those fears, then you're more likely to achieve your goals. So um, you can find this again on my website, so you can actually like fill it out yourself, go through it, and then you can also, Tim Ferriss is great, definitely listen to his TED Talks, and um, he has a podcast, and he has a, I think it's episode 422 that talks all about fear setting and his experience with it and whatnot. So I hope that was helpful, and if you have any questions about the exams or, um, you know, getting started or anything like that. I'm here. And, um, uh, I see you, ADU. I, you have some great questions. I'm going to mainly talk about the ARVs today. So, um, I'm happy to answer your questions at another one or, um, you can DM me too, which is good. Um, let's see, I can go back and see if there was any questions too. And sorry about in the beginning, the little hiccup of actually getting this all figured out. This is my first live, so I don't know what I'm doing. Um, good, I'm glad to see uh, some excitement. Uh, so took a sample test without studying and took 40% or got 40%. That's pretty good. Um, and I think too, like with that, taking your s sample test, it totally depends on which tests you're taking too, because sometimes you could get really bad scores and still pass the exam just because it's some sample tests are better than the other. Um, yeah, when you fail, you do feel awful. It's not fun feeling, but you know you get past it for sure. Um, and and I do want to say too that like for my first fail it took me probably like five months even just to get back to take it again and that's common for I failed a couple times not the same test but a couple different tests and at each time it was just I think it's uh emotionally and uh physically draining because you study so hard and then you sit for like four hours and then by the end you're just like oh my gosh last thing I want to do is go do that again so it takes a little while to um 
to get back on it, but it's worth it. <laughs> um, are there study groups to study with? Definitely. Um, there's tons of study groups out there. You can either, if with the, whatever school you went to, you can check in with them. That If you're, I don't know what, if you're in San Diego or not, but um, AIA has a bunch of different divisions around America. I don't know if you're even in America, but, um, and like AIA San Diego has one and they have certain area areas that you can um, get coordinated with and they have groups set up. There's also tons of on um, Facebook. There's a really good, it's called, I think it's just called the Airy Facebook group. That one's really good. There's always people getting together. Um, Young Architect, you can find him on Instagram. Um, he has a great program called uh, the Young Architect Bootcamp, and he puts together really good groups, and I've he heard people rave about that. Um, and then also on NCARB's website, they have a whole AI, ARE community, and on there you can go on there and see if sometimes there's people in your area that are putting together groups. Um, there's definitely groups available, so that's worth checking out, and there's a bunch of different resources for that. I would start probably with, well, any of the ones I just mentioned. <laughs> um, getting started, Damien, uh, what tools you, to use to study? So I did a whole post and um, video on my website that has all that information of what I used. And I put together a spreadsheet that shows all the books I used, uh, links to them, um, all that stuff, because there is a lot of different options out there. So this is what worked for me. Um, some people, you know, there are a lot of options, so people can use a bunch of different things. But, um, yeah, if you want to go look on that, it's on my under my blog. It's one of the first ones. It's just called ARE, uh, how to get through the AREs. So that'll have all that information. Um, uh, you can definitely register for the exam while you haven't had a job. Um, and I think you can even register for the exams uh, even without finishing your internship, uh, AXP program, um, it kind of depends on, I think that work experience really helps you through the exams, especially if you've only gone through school and never worked in the industry, because school really teaches like the foundations and, um, like of how to think like a designer, uh, kind of like conceptual, how to think about space and, and uh, how to be a problem solver, but it doesn't really teach about what's on the exam. I mean, the exam's more like, for example, practice management. It's gonna talk about firm structure and contracts and LLC versus you know, a C Corp and um, even uh, financial spreadsheets, stuff that like maybe went over for two weeks in, um, a class, but definitely information that you need to really study for. So there has been people who went through school and then just studied really hard for the exams and passed. Um, but having the work experience definitely is helpful, especially once you get to the design and construction side of the exams. Um, uh, Damien also hasn't finished school, so not aware of failing or costs. Well, um, if you just go on the, if you just look up the ARE pass rates, I think it's between like 49 and 51%. So with any exam that has a percentage like that, there's going to be fails. And, um, the exams, I think they just went up last year. They're like 250 now, I think. Um, but again, there's a lot, there's scholarships out there for them. And also the way I think about it is, it's an investment for your future. So $250, well, once you're a licensed architect, that's like, I mean, depending on where you're working, but maybe an 250 That's probably like, what, two hours worth of billable hours or whatnot. I mean, I think it's important to think of it as an investment into your future. If you look at it as 250 or look at it as a whole. I mean, even look at it as a whole, I would think, okay, well, look how much we just spent on architecture school or, you know, all that. And then now you can't call yourself an architect. It's worth maybe a couple thousand dollars to invest in yourself to reach your goals. Um, 
And I believe that if you put out that money to reach those goals, that it will come back to you tenfold. So um, money is kind of all a perception. So and everyone deals with that perception differently. But if you look at it as an investment into yourself and know that that money is going to come back to you, uh, it's totally worth it. Um, failing is totally frustrating. I 100% agree. Um, oh, you're so sweet. You remember me when you, that you, yes, exactly. You can always retake it. Uh, I failed my PPD two times and then I was going in to take my third and after your third try, you do have to wait a year. And I remember being terrified that I was going to fail that third time. That was actually my very last exam. And knowing and thinking that um, I would have to wait a whole nother year. And I know, you know, having that fear, well, I was going to say having that fear wasn't really healthy, but at the same time, I still went in and I did it. So I guess the realization that I was going to have to maybe wait a year was there. And so I addressed it, but it was not a fun idea. And, um, but luckily I passed and then I was done. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really frustrating and it's okay to feel frustrated with an, with a fail and it's okay to take a couple days and, or a week or a couple weeks and not want to open up your, um, anything right now because it's okay to just, you know, take a break from it, but know that, yeah, exactly. You can take it again. You can take it again. And eventually you will get through it. If you stick with it, you will get through it for sure. Um, any th- other questions? Um, 235. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, I think, it, yeah, I think they went up. I think it was 210. It was 210 last year and then they went up 235. So, well, thank you guys. I appreciate you uh, being here for my very first live. Uh, I hope it was informational and I hope that the, um, the toolkit will help you. Cause I think that that where you actually can sit with your own thoughts and your own, um, fears and everything and work through that. I think it's motivational to see the benefits and I think it'll inspire hopefully to, to schedule your first exam. So let me know. I want to hear if you guys schedule your exam And if you do, if you pass, if you don't and you fail, don't be afraid to tell me it's okay to fail. I'm here for you. You are not a failure and you're not a bad designer if you fail. That's important to know. You're only going to get better if you take it again. You're only going to be a better designer at the end. So I appreciate you guys. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. And hopefully the next live I do will be a little more streamlined. All right, guys. Thank you.